Hello, I'm Alfred Weber, and we have the great privilege and pleasure to have with us uh, Richard Dolan, who is the author of, among other books, After Disclosure, A.D. And uh, Richard um, uh, has a long history. I think a, a 15 year. He's he's been in the field uh, 15 years, and is a preeminent scholar. Um, of of the UFO uh, phenomenon has written volumes uh, one and two in his history of UFOs and the national security state. And I think you're you're working on volume three, is it? Um, yes, I am, Fred. Uh, in fact, I've been working on that uh, pretty much all day before our interview. Well, good, and that'll th that'll be out next year. I I I understand. I hope. I hope so. I think uh, late late next year is is very very possible. Yes. Excellent. Doing my well, good. You know, I when I when when I saw your book, I I, I said, well, <laughs> this is this is a very this is a very creative book, and in some senses, um, a a risky book, because um, the fundamental question is. Uh, what makes you think that there is going to be extraterrestrial disclosure in our lifetimes? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I've, for the last number of years, I've considered disclosure very much a paradox, something that is impossible given the current paradigm, current reality that we find ourselves in. But also I feel that it is nevertheless inevitable. Uh, but why is it impossible? Well, you and I have both looked at this still for a very long time. I'm sure many people uh, watching this right now understand that those, let's look at the, the structure of power, the human structure of power, first of all, that is in possession of this, uh, this secret. I believe that there is such a group. Uh, they have no motivation for giving this secret up at all, it seems to me. They have much too much to lose. And in fact, the last 60 plus years of the, the modern history of the world show us that there isn't really any, anything um, that we can show that's been a definite disclosure effort on their part. So left to their own devices, I think that those people in possession of this secret might very well opt to continue along that same path. Then you've got the other intelligences that are here interacting on this planet, interacting with humanity. Uh, let's call them the extraterrestrials. Maybe that is what they are. They, too, have been uh, pretty much low-key, I would say, in their overt presence on this world. They've certainly been seen by many, many millions of people, at least in terms of uh, the artifacts that they leave in the sky and flying around in the oceans. Uh, there have been encounters that many, many people have had with these beings, but they haven't made any kind of official announcement, so they too have been operating in a sense by stealth, you might say. Uh, so that's two things right there, but then there's a third factor in this equation, and that factor is us. It is our society. It's, it's our civilization. And you see, I think that's the, the variable in the equation that's going to force this disclosure. And the reason is that simply that our rate of change in our society is so incredibly rapid right now that, um, I mean, look where we were just 20 years ago, you know, 1991. We had a situation where the Cold War had just ended. We had no internet to speak of globally, or just a bar barely an internet. Um, we didn't have a way of communicating globally the way that we do today. We didn't have a lot of the technologies that we have today in terms of uh, like little smartphones. And, um, in other words, ways to capture and communicate reality to each other. Uh, our ability in that is increasing exponentially. And then I look at, at future likely developments, for example, uh, in computing. Uh, we're expected now to have computers in another generation or so, that is another human generation, 20 years from now, that could very well be considered sentient in some way or another. Uh, advanced enough AI that they're going to seem like they're conscious beings, no matter how we want to define consciousness, 
they may seem like they are, except for the fact that they won't need sleep, they won't need coffee to get their brains working in the morning. They'll be uh, with a maybe a relative IQ of 500 or higher, for all we know, pulling any kind of data off the Internet instantly. So in other words, what we might be able to see in another 20 years is that the dominant intelligence on our in our civilization might be substantially higher than it is already. Um, and I ask myself, in that kind of an environment, are we really going to be um, in the same place as we are in 2011 in terms of understanding and being able to get this reality out in the open? I look at things like WikiLeaks. WikiLeaks is only is less than five years old, or it's about five years old as an organization. And I think it's fair to say that even 10 years ago, WikiLeaks wasn't even really quite possible. It's possible now, and it's made an enormous impact on our world. And what kind of impact will WikiLeaks or uh, any other copycat type of organization in another 10 or 20 years be able to have on our world in terms of this topic? So that, in other words, there's no motivation for the powers that be, let's call them that, to release this information. But the fact is that it is us, uh, our society, that is forcing this issue and will, I believe anyway, force them into a position where at some point they must make a statement because, frankly, the world already knows. And that's how I think it will be. So that, in other words, disclosure isn't the end of anything. Disclosure is going to be the beginning of an entire new fight the new fight for truth. Um, if the president of the United States is the person who makes this admission, um, I think there's a very high likelihood that he or she will be forced into doing it and that new revelations, any revelations about these other beings and the whole situation that's been going on behind the scenes, that it very well may have to be pried out by one citizen action after another after another. So that's a long-winded answer to this question as to why I think it will happen. I think it will happen, but it'll be forced. Right. Now, um, from from my reading, uh, I would say that uh, one could make a case that, that uh, yes, there's a, a, a rate of change in the human pop population, but that perhaps it is the extraterrestrials that are forcing the issue and that we don't have a monolithic extraterrestrial, uh, we, that the range of extraterrestrial civilizations and motivations are not monolithic, but rather there's a great deal of differences among them and a great mm -hmm. deal of differences in the relationships that they have. And some of them may be flat against disclosure, and some of them may be pushing for disclosure at this time. And this is amongst the m most highly volatile and, and most speculative realm in the kind of, quote, exopolitical field. That is the study right. of relations among extraterrestrial civilizations and how they r relate to ours. Um, and uh, uh, let's start with the extraterrestrial civilization that's credited with uh, uh, entering to agreements and apparently abducting, uh, you know, by public opinion polls, up to six million people. If you take the Roper poll. Yeah. Um, as a kind of a benchmark, um, their interests would seem to be not to not to uh, uh, have a disclosure. Right. Uh, I agree. Uh, uh, and I and I wondered if you could talk a bit about the the abducting greys and what you've come up in the abduction program. And and, yeah, so, well, and and how that fits in. Well, it's it's uh, one of the most explosive aspects of this entire phenomenon, as you rightly point out. Uh, a, I completely agree that there's there doesn't seem to be any indication that that these beings are pushing for any kind of disclosure. I uh, not in any of the open literature that I've read, nor in any. Um, 
individuals that I've spoken to in my own meanderings in this world of secrecy, I've not gotten any indication that these greys are interested in doing in promoting a disclosure. Um, I still feel it will happen despite their opposition to it, despite the opposition of, of the human power elite to it. Again, because I feel that we, our society, is the great agent of change. In terms of the abduction phenomenon, uh, this is, you know, among the most difficult issues for any political leadership to deal with. How I would not, excuse me, I would not uh, envy any U.S. president that has to make this announcement that, yes, the phenomenon of UFOs is real. Some of this UFO phenomenon seems to involve extraterrestrial intelligences because within 60 seconds of that announcement, I guarantee you, there are going to be many people asking about abductions. If it's true that there are other beings here, well then, how crazy is it that some of these abduction claims are in fact true after all, and, and indeed, that's going to be on the table, and it's going to be very difficult to put away. And how do we as a society deal with this fact that potentially millions of people have been taken with their memories, to a large extent, managed, controlled, at least temporarily, things being done to them, apparently without their consent, um, yeah, it's a very, very difficult issue, and it's one that can, I think, easily uh, escalate into a very hostile relationship between our society and, and these other beings, if, if there isn't one already, covertly, for all we know. And there's a lot of variables here that I personally just don't know. Um, I suspect, for instance, that there is a kind of clandestine Cold War going on right now maybe even a hot war, but I don't know this for sure. My speculations are that it may be, it may be happening, though. Uh, certainly, we have a long, well, I was just going to say a long history of our own military chasing these objects, uh, which tells me that there's some kind of trouble in paradise going on to begin with. Yeah, so um, uh, just, ju just to parse out the, 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 the different parts of this, we, we have, on, on the one hand, some evidence, at least from whistleblowers or contactees, that there may be secret agreements between certain races, certain gray races, allowing the abductions to occur. Uh, right. It, is that, is that con consistent with, with what you know and what, what you've uncovered? I would say it's possible, yes. Uh, certainly, just as you have heard these, these stories, I've heard them many times, and um, I can't dismiss them. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I can't be... It's difficult because none of us have uh, access to what a, a scholar would consider you know, absolute, undeniable proof of this. What we have, unfortunately, because we're dealing with uh, something akin to a neo-fascist kind of state that we're up against here that doesn't give out the information freely, we have to rely on leaks. We have to rely on rumors. And that's, unfortunately, a somewhat unsatisfactory position to find ourselves in. So on that basis, I think, yes, it's entirely possible that these rumors are true. I don't know that they're true. If... If, I mean, here's one of the problems with disclosure. Um, it, it's going to open up a, a real mess for us because we very likely will get to the point where we're able as a society to prove that these others are here interacting with us. But we may not be at a point where we are able to grab one of these beings and put them next to the president at the podium so that we can all like see for ourselves exactly what they look like and what they are. So that, in other words... I think it's going to take a generation or more for the difficulties and the questions of disclosure to be, begin to be resolved. I have a feeling what's going to happen instead is um, our society is going to be fragmented uh, along the, you know, the full spectrum of opinion. And, and it's very possible 
that things are going to get a lot worse before they get better in terms of our own understanding of this. So that as you're, you know, uh, discussing the, uh, the issue, was there an agreement, for example, in 1954 to, to uh, exchange, allow human abductions in exchange for ET technology? Let's just say that that's the case. How do we prove that? And will we know this for sure to our satisfaction in the immediate aftermath of disclosure? That's not quite a certain, it's not a slam dunk. We may be able, as a society, get enough information that we're satisfied that we know the truth. But then again, not everyone may be satisfied with it. Well, we, you know? we, we have whistleblower testimony. If you consider the, the testimonies of people like Phil Schneider, uh, that there were under that there were underground bases with uh, certain races of ET great gray ETs with but genetic. I mean, I, I'm sorry. Well, this is the problem. Schneider is someone that I I have turned over and over and over in my mind more times than I can I can remember. Okay. And I can count. And the fact is that Schneider's testimony does not impress a large number of people who've studied this in great detail. He does impress a large number of other people. Right. So the question is what, is, what do we do with Schneider's testimony after disclosure? The only thing that we can do is to try to find ways of pulling out of the black budget world information pertaining to this so that if we get um, large amounts of corroboration in terms of either documentation or other forms of data, then yes, we can move ahead with Schneider's claims. As it is right now, uh, Schneider, like so many of these whistleblowers, is, is not able to, to get, get us to home plate. You know, we can get to, to first or second or third base, depending on who the person is. But uh, I do think it's, it's a slippery slope. If we accept at face value the testimony of all of these whistleblowers, I think that's very problematic, at least as far as my own perspective in, in analyzing this. And I'm not even saying that these people are, um, are lying. And most of them, the ones that I have spoken to, I think are, are truthful, but that doesn't mean that they haven't been messed with in one form or another. And so testimony has to be uh, taken, I think, with some reserve. And not just saying, yes, I know that this is true. And that includes Phil Schneider. Yeah. Well, I was chatting I, with an experienced UFO researcher less than a week ago who used the words BS to describe Schneider. And this, this Schneider. researcher is quite experienced in the, in the field. Right. So. Now, you, you've made quite a, a, a contribution to the public understanding recently by developing a concept of, quote, the breakaway civilization, and and yeah. I I now hear that wherever I go. I mean, people are talking about <laughs> the breakaway civilization, and they may or may not know that you're the person that really conceptualized that. Yeah. And it's it's that's right. something that's 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 out there, and that really has uh, facilitated an understanding of the dilemma that we who are in the quote constitutional I, I I've been searching for a word for the non breakaway civilization and since I'm an attorney the word the constitutional economy or the constitutional civilization has been the only one I've been able to come up with have, I, have you come up with some other term or no, I, I don't uh, go out looking for these. I, they, right. that, that one just came to me. I was yeah. writing it. Uh, I mean, in fact, I'm, I'm going to be putting an article out uh, probably in, within the next week or two that really describes uh, my whole concept of a breakaway civilization in a nice, coherent way. I mean, I've got it in, uh, in a bit of volume two of UFOs in the national security state and then expanded quite a bit in AD after disclosure. So it's there. But I think I'd like to put it in article form so it's out on the net. Uh, the idea of a breakaway civilization is really uh, disarmingly simple. It has to do with uh, our understanding of the black budget world to begin with. So as I often like to put it, let's imagine that we are in a black budget community. Uh, we've been charged with uh, studying a particular 
uh, piece of ET technology or a whole array of ET te technologies. And, uh, of course, for many years, we're kind of baffled by it. But, of course, we've got a team of genius scientists working with us. And at a certain point, we make some breakthroughs in um, our understanding of the technology. And maybe we might understand new scientific principles as a result. Now, some of the breakthroughs would simply be just nice money makers, whether it's better integrated circuits or uh, fiber optics or things that can easily be segued into profitable, um, you know, profit centers for us and nice ground floor investment opportunities while we're at it, thereby reducing our incentive to give up this secret to zero, right? But let's say we make other breakthroughs as well in our understanding, breakthroughs that can't be shared with the world, whether it's electrogravitics, anti-gravity, uh, new sources of energy, something that would replace petroleum, for instance. To me, that's the big one. Let's say we do understand, we learn that there is another source of energy, an amazing source of energy, clean, cheap, or almost free, that would essentially replace petroleum almost immediately if we were to let this out. Well, that's when our boss would say to us, no, no, I don't think you'll be letting that out. Uh, that would take down, if not the world's largest industry, then one of the top two or three largest industries. I keep going back and forth as to whether oil is the biggest, big pharmaceuticals the biggest, or narcotics trafficking, who knows. But oil is certainly the foundation for so much of our civilization. But that doesn't mean that we would stop researching these radical technologies, now would it? So let's say we make a breakthrough in the early 1960s, or even before how far along would we be now in the 21st century with our understanding? And not just in terms of propulsion, but let's say biotech breakthroughs, genetics, uh, computing, artificial intelligence, nanotech. We, in other words, could be so far ahead of the rest of the world. Now, what is the definition of a civilization? It's maybe kind of hard to pin down exactly. But we can see a couple of things about it. One is maybe our level of technology. Another would be our social relations with each other and with the rest of the world. Another might still be our cosmology, how we conceive of the world and our place in the universe. Well, I would submit that in all of these uh, respects, we would be in a very, very different place vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. We would essentially have a separate civilization, one that is broken away from the main civilization, i.e. a breakaway civilization. So that's the concept. Uh, to give you an idea of how far advanced they might be, I will relate a conversation that I had with one scientist who was with the NSA in the 1960s, mid-60s, he, and he told me that NSA computers at that time had a clock speed of about 650 megahertz. Now, the rest of the world did not achieve that clock speed. The personal computing market didn't until around the year 2000, about 10 years ago. So in other words, NSA was about 35 years ahead of the rest of the world, if you want to look at it that way. Where might a breakaway civilization be in some of their technologies? Can they go off-world? Can they have interactions with some of these other beings in ways that the rest of us poor slobs here in the regular world can't just do every day, but maybe they can. And so that, in other words, these the members of this group, this civilization, would be in a very, very different place in terms of their understanding of this. And they might, in fact, really despair, I wonder, of the ability of bringing the rest of us up to speed. The farther ahead they go, the farther they leave us behind, possibly. And they might just think, you know, too much work to bring everyone else up to speed. Let's just uh, keep doing our thing. It might be a very difficult thing. Now, I, here's the thing. I don't personally envision this breakaway civilization as completely divorced from our own society. Now, my sense is that they would have family here. They'd have mothers and fathers, right? They'd have cousins and so on, and they might have family reunions. And so they, they would still have a foot in this world, but they would also have extended duties, extended tours that would be in a very different environment. So how the built infrastructure works, do they have their own families? Is it like alternative three on Mars or on the moon or deep underground? That I don't really know for sure. But I do think that there is a large degree of separateness 
that they have developed. Um, you know, the interesting thing about this idea, I've been chatting with a number of other researchers who, who've also found it to be a very compelling idea, and they, they, go, they run with it. They, they take this idea in their own direction, their own research, which is great. Uh, the more people looking into this, the better, as far as I see, and uh, the more we can really learn from each other. Well, it, it isn't though the the impetus of quote the breakaway civilization against extraterrestrial disclosure? I mean, you you sort of implied that in what you were just saying. It is, but again, uh, I, I see three fundamental parts of the secrecy equation: the extraterrestrials the secret keepers, and let's conflate them for the moment with the breakaway civilization, all right? And then, but the third part of the equation is us. And what I see is our own ability jumping, leaps, leaping ahead, leaping ahead in our own capabilities as a society. So that I think uh, these people are like a little Dutch boy trying to put his finger in the dike, but there's just too many holes in the dike. So that uh, we're like the ocean, <laughs> and we're going to blast that dike through. Now, the question is, when will it happen? Will it be as soon as five years from now? I used to think the answer to that was no, and I'm no longer sure that it will, that it will take so long. I think it could be five years from now. Uh, I don't think it's going to be next week. I just uh, read, saw an interview with Louis Farrakhan in which he said it was going to happen in April of this year, and uh, I don't know where he's gotten his information but from. We're, I'm not we're, seeing that. We're, we're, we're more than halfway through April, so. Indeed. To today. Yeah, that's right. Picking late April. Uh, now, of course, if this airs and it's already happened, well, then there you go. Farrakhan will be seen as a prophet. Um, but I do think it's going to happen within less than a decade, I think it is very possible. Whereas just a few years ago, I was not of this opinion. A few years ago, I would say maybe 20 years. And now I'm, I think it could be much sooner. Well, um, yeah. Now, now let me ask you just, just, a, just a detailed question. Uh, just in the last few weeks, uh, there's been a release through the, quote, FBI vault of certain documents relating to the Roswell incident. The hotel, is it? Is it pronounced? Hotel, hotel? Memo. Yeah. What's your, uh, uh, what, what's your opinion of these of these documents and of this release by the by the FBI vault? Yeah, thanks for asking. Well, uh, the first thing that has to be said is that these are not new documents to the public by any means. I mean, they may be new to people who've read them, but these particular documents, all of them, have been out for decades. Uh, the Guy Hotel memo in fact, was obtained in 1977 by Dr. Bruce McAbee in one of the early FOI requests of the government. This is back in the heyday of the Freedom of Information Act during the Jimmy Carter administration, when, in fact, Freedom of Information Act requests were um, kind, of, kind of sort of effective for a little while. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a fact, a little known fact, that of the thousands of documents that we now have pertaining to UFOs through FOIA, it is still true that more than 50% of them were obtained during the presidency of Jimmy Carter. That's uh, a sad and shocking truth. Uh, FOIA has had its ups and downs, and mostly downs, since the onset of the Reagan administration. Now, the hotel memo is genuine. It's, it's a real document not hoax, in other words. And the question is, what does it mean? Well, the first thing is that it does not refer to Roswell. That's one thing that has to be understood. Uh, it's a memo dated from March uh, 22, 1950. Now, it does refer, however, to the Aztec crash, or the Aztec event. Some people don't believe it was a crash. I happen to believe that there was a crash of a UFO at Aztec, New Mexico in March of 1948. It took me a long time to come to that opinion. Um, as you know, I'm sure there are many UFO researchers who don't believe that there was an actual crash at Aztec. The reason for this is that um, the story was written about 
in its first published form by uh, a, a journalist named Frank Scully way back in 1950. And it was only a year or two later that Scully's work was savaged and debunked in the mainstream media. Uh, I think in 1952 was when that happened. And so ever since then, people just, anytime they would hear of the Aztec crash, they'd just go running and saying, oh, no, no, that was a hoax. But in fact, what Aztec sort of had its own rebirth kind of like Roswell during the 1970s and 80s, with the difference that, that, that um, let me back up, it had its rebirth in the sense that many researchers started to look at it again and started to find reason to give it credibility. Different from Roswell, however, because it never got the kind of critical mass within the UFO research community to accept it, to embrace it as something that happened. But the thing about the Aztec crash is that it's not, it's not done. Uh, there's more research still being done. There's a new book being written about the Aztec crash by a friend of mine, Scott Ramsey, who I think is going to be doing very, very good work with us. So here's how it ties in with the Hotel Memo. A guy Hotel was an uh, FBI special agent who learned about this event through what appears to be a lecture given by Silas Newton in Denver on March 8, 1950. Now, Newton is one of these guys that still is somewhat an enigma to me. He appears to have been a shady character. He learned about this event. I'm not sure how he learned about this event, but he learned about it and started talking about it. And it was through that lecture that Hotel learned about this event. Uh, if you read that memo carefully, you don't really find a whole lot of analysis about it. It's just essentially repeating a story from a source. Uh, now, it's interesting that he wrote it to the director of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover. So that's quite interesting. Um, so essentially, the hotel memo is one of these, um, it's sort of difficult to decide what we think of it because many of us aren't really sure what we think of the Aztec crash. My own personal opinion is that what Hotel was getting was an indirect uh, story of something that fundamentally was true, but that was filtered through a couple of layers of, you know, that old uh, game when we were kids, one person whispers into the ear of someone else, and then that person whispers the story into someone right. else's ear and on it. And I think that's sort of what happened in the case of this Hotel memo. So I do think personally that there was some truth involved. I've chatted with some researchers recently who just think it was completely based on the, the bogus story, you know, that the Aztec story was bogus. Um, I don't, I'm not quite of that opinion. Uh, and there were a couple of other things of this FBI memo, uh, website. So let me just, uh, I'll just wrap up this thought here. Uh, they released a number of documents and the ones that they've highlighted all were these, some of the more sensational documents that they had. But again, all of them had, had been available publicly for many, many years. Now, so as to why they, exactly, I, I, don't, I, I don't know the answer as to why now the FBI did this. Yeah. So, so why is it, do you think that an event like that at this time got such global play by the mainstream media? Well, I think it happened as a result of, uh, I think there was one website, uh, I haven't traced this exactly, but I think All News Web might have been the first site to really make a big thing out of this. If I'm not mistaken, uh, it would have been Michael Cohen's site. Sure. I think, this is what I've heard. And then from there, it just got Facebook to death. So that Facebook copy and paste phenomenon just went zoom, and it went viral, and that is what generated uh, or at least got some mainstream attention. I could be wrong about that, but that's my current understanding of it. Now, let me pick up on a very interesting statement that you just made. You said that that you think, I, and I don't want to put words in, in your mouth, but that if disclosure occurs, it might occur within about five years. Is, is that fair? Enough? I think it's possible, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Why, why do you pick that number five years? 
Because I look at our technological trajectory, and on that basis, to me, I, I see our society being driven primarily on the basis of the tech developments that we are currently in the middle of going through, which is just revolutionizing our society on a regular basis. I mean, the fact that you and I are having this video chat on Skype is just one example of how our world is transforming itself on a practically daily basis. It's a quite extraordinary development. And I would foresee that about five years from now, um, yeah, because look, YouTube is just over five years old. Smartphones are about five years old, roughly speaking. Um, where are we going to be in another five years in terms of new technological developments and new capabilities at extracting data from the world around us, possibly in ways that we have not even imagined just yet? So I think that it's quite possible. Um, and that it could happen in five years. It could be ten years, but it could be five. Things happen fast, and they happen without warning. I look at the events in the Middle East. They happened without a whole lot of warning for the most, most part. Uh, whammo. And in fact, uh, that's quite relevant for our discussion here. Uh, it was WikiLeaks that was one of the key sparks of what became the revolution in Tunisia. Wiki, everyone had known how horribly depraved the Tunisian government was, but it wasn't until WikiLeaks took a bunch of documents of relating to this and put them out there for the world to see made it really an impossible conclusion to escape that prompted one young man who was out of work and out of hope to set himself ablaze. And from there, the deluge. It happened after that. WikiLeaks, again, is one of the manifestations of this era in which we live, a manifestation that could not have been possible of, you know, just a few years ago. And so where are another five years are we going to be in terms of our capabilities to force governments to make an admission on this? Well, we could be far enough along that uh, five years could be the case. Just a guess. Uh, yeah. Um, now, now let me, uh, the, the, the five years figure interests me because I've been tracing a line of re research that also converges on five years as a plausible disclosure, disclosure scenario yep. from another level of research, which your more conservative researchers would, might dismiss out of hand. But on the other hand, uh, perhaps more open-minded researchers, especially in the exopolitical field, might look at it. And that is um, <clears throat> uh, our, our, our former colleague, he, he died in December of 2010 of pancreatic cancer. But a, uh, 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 and, there, and there are two separate individuals. One is a uh, uh, former NORAD officer uh, who wrote a uh, a memoir of his yeah. interactions uh, with uh, uh, what eventually turned out to be, he, he says, a, um, a galactic organization or galactic council uh, composed of uh, the Alpha Centaurians, the Pleiadians, the Syrians, and even the Greys from Bhutis, who oversee matters in this realm of the galaxy, and and that, and that to traditional nuts and bolts UFO researchers that drives them wild, but to a branch of exopolitical researchers that drives them crazy, in a different way because it's very interesting research and. Uh, this this fellow put out his book, and in his book he said, and 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 they've told me that on October thirteenth, uh, they're going to show their their fleet of UFOs over New York City, and in fact, over New York City on on October thirteenth, there were there was a showing of of 
UFOs. And um, uh, it was a show of something. Uh, uh, I, I don't know yeah. that it's been definitively, you know, shown to me that it was UFOs. It it might be. It's it's they are. It was a curious sighting. I will certainly agree yeah. with that. And and so then I I came into contact with a second individual, who's a former uh, NATO Spanish intelligence agent who claims that he was contacted by the same council and told on November 9, 2010, that on November 24th, there would be uh, a, a showing of UFOs over New York. And he put that out on November 9th, and it was written up by a, a Spanish journalist and published at that time. And in fact, people were out in New York on November 24th, and there are vehicles, and that sighting is fairly substantial. You can go to exopolitics.com and see the videos from from that night. So we, we have an independent other person who says that this happened. Now, this is usual in the in the UFO world. I mean, there there are. Per, People say, oh, there's going to be this sighting, and then there's a question as to whether it occurred or not. And then there were sightings predicted for over Moscow and London. And uh, I've, you know, uh, there's, there's questions as to whether they occurred or not. A case can be made as to whether they were. What role do you think that data like this play in... Uh, kind of sifting through the tea leaves about whether disclosure is occurring. Right. I'm glad you asked this. Uh, I have my own quiet sources. I never publicize them. Um, and I have not I have not at any point gotten reason to believe that there is an actual galactic council. I have had reason to believe that there are multiple groups engaging with us here, and that these groups, as you uh, mentioned earlier in our, our chat here, have differing agendas. And this is the information is, that I have gotten very quietly from um, a couple of different sources as well that I believe have, have, have good reason to be telling me what they do. Um, so when I'm asked about a galactic council, I can't I'm not dismissing this out of hand, but I have not, in my own research, encountered evidence for this. And so it, it's very hard for me to embrace this. Uh, now, the larger question is how do we, as responsible researchers, deal with information that is like this? Well, uh, that is, in other words, information that comes from alleged insiders or alleged um, individuals who have access to such information. And I think the first word is caution. We have to have caution. That doesn't mean we throw it out. But it means, uh, at least, if nothing else, we qualify all statements from these people with the proviso that this is simply an unproven, as of now, uh, claim. And that until we get um, information that's confirmed to a much higher level of, of um, satisfaction to right. independent analysts, that we really can't, I, I think that we're not being responsible if we simply accept these out of hand. And there's always a strong tendency for people to do this, and I've, I've just never felt that this is how I, I can go about my own research. Now, I'm going to go back yet one more time then, um, and just say that, you know, because of the, the political situation we find ourselves in, that is the fact that we're not on a level playing field, as it were, with our government. We are absolutely not. We are dealing in a very unequal power relationship here, where there are certain groups that have a preponderance of information and power and control. And we little researchers that we are, are trying to fight this system and to try to learn what's going on. And 
they're not giving us the information that we as citizens of what is supposed to be a free society are, you know, able to get. Okay. In that situation, we have to consider leaks. We have to consider sources that can't immediately be verified, but we have to be careful about it. And we have to subject those sources to as much rigor as we can. All right. We have to, we have to do extra work. We have to do double duty here. We've got to get the leaks, but we also have to do the vetting and the independent research to the best of our ability. Otherwise, see, here's the problem. Um, it's difficult being out on the cutting edge when people come to you because sometimes people are just trying to jerk your chain, and it happens, and we know it happens in our field. And so we put out 10 stories, and three of them turn out to be fake. Seven turn out to be true. So the question is, from the point of view of, of people being able to do anything about this, we've essentially disabled ourselves as, as viable because <coughs> reading our information is not going to have the confidence in knowing, well, you know, is this true or is this not true? And so there's always going to be a certain amount of doubt. This is exactly what the, the power structure wants. Uh, the power structure, I've, I've come to understand they don't really need to completely debunk uh, what we do. It's not necessary. All they need to do is sow the seed of doubt. That's all they have to do. No matter what the event is, whether it's the JFK assassination or 9-11 or UFOs, ETs, all they have to do is, through some of their sources in the mainstream media, provide enough of a counter-argument so that, so that people doubt so that they're not 100% sure. And really, from their point of view, if they can do that, then they've, they've won. What we need to do as researchers is, is nail our, our research down as rigorously as we can so that we can counter that effectively. It's exactly. So I, we, we are really more the bleeding edge. That, that, that is why, that rather than the leading edge, it's been called the bleeding edge. Because sometimes you get caught by the bleeding edge of the razor but you know um, what that's really good i yeah, think you're right yeah yeah now uh you know just to to carry one point because i haven't had the privilege of having this particular dialogue with you i don't think and i and i'd certainly like to have it and it's a and it's a dialogue uh i don't think in two an abstruse area of exopolitics sort of in a kind of a political science type dialogue. But uh, when I was developing uh, uh, my, my first book on, on exopolitics and, and mm -hmm. kind of that approach, uh, and I, I come at it from a very definite perspective, which is different from other researchers in the areas, I come at it from the perspective of a futurist, and I was trained as a futurist at Stanford Research Institute, and, um, and and that and that was my function there, and there, uh, of course, two of my colleagues, uh, uh, Dr. Hal Putoff and Russell Targ, were doing quote remote viewing. Uh, and uh, there are laboratory protocols to rem remote viewing, and you do get replicable results. And one of the definitions of the scientific method, as we know, is that you have standard laboratory protocols, and if you get replicable results, that qualifies officially as knowledge acquired according to the scientific method, you know, provided other things are. And so they would go out and acquire knowledge about distant targets. And Correct. Yeah. This would be saying, okay, well, Dr. Courtney Brown, who was with whom I've been collaborating over these this past decade in in exopolitics, he has um, uh, his 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 institute employs has employed the largest on certain projects the largest number of former military remote military trained remote viewers in these secret projects, and. He was uh, one of the leaders who said, well, let's turn this 
remote viewing capability and not limit it to Soviet targets, but let's go out into the universe and let's yeah. start talking to civilization, to off-planet civilizations. And he said, well, not only off-planet civilizations, but civilizations in other, quote, dimensions, which are sort of energy bands. Well, yeah. he made contact with uh, uh, a representative of, quote, the Galactic Federation in remote viewing using a standard laboratory protocol and was able to replicate it and has transcripts. So in terms of my acting as a political scientist or an exo exopolitical scientist, I then took those transcripts and developed a model of, in the exopolitical model, a model of the, what, of the Galactic Federation and how it functioned. Using that, using the remote viewing derived knowledge which qualifies under the scientific method as the data source. So that's what I published in my book, Exopolitics, right. and how I qualified the existence of a galactic federation. So I wanted to share that with you. What's your evaluation or kind of comment about that methodology and that kind of data? Gladly. I'm, I'm so glad you asked about this because I, too, am very interested in remote viewing. Uh, I've written about it and studied it myself, and um, I'm very familiar with Courtney Brown's uh, work on this as well. Um, <clears throat> remote viewing has been re replicable, and it is a valid uh, phenomenon. The only thing where I would have a quibble with what you're saying is as follows. Uh, remote viewing has been shown to have uh, hits, as it were, where really, you know, pure chance would not have it. And not just across space, but across time. So that these remote viewers have accurately been able to see things that have not yet happened, but are about to happen. Things that happened in the past, uh, and things that happened elsewhere on Earth and beyond. Um, I had a, a very extensive chat uh, with Ingo Swan a number of years ago. In fact, I spent an evening in his home, uh, and he went over with me the entire... A uh, fascinating, uh, you know, experiment he did about J with the planet Jupiter, and also Mercury, as I recall, and so much. So remote viewing um, proves to me, as it does to you, that the human mind, the human soul, whatever it is about us, that we are able to transcend the limitations of this body and our senses of this body. Okay, fine. I'm with all of that. Now, the problem with using remote viewing as, as a reliable source of information is that, as any of the remote viewers will tell you, they have a problem with what they call analytical overlay. They used to, back before there was America Online, they had AOL, but it meant analytical, analytic overlay. And all that meant was it wasn't that the information, the, the, the things they were seeing were wrong, but time and again they had a problem with with interpreting those things incorrectly. So, uh, you know, there was too much analytical uh, interpretation, and they were not just letting the, uh, the images come to them. So you understand what I'm saying here. So that the remote viewing as an intelligence tool uh, is, is useful, but it's not a sure thing. It's, its value is somewhat limited in that regard. And this is what I would say about any kind of remote viewed data, about any topic that can't be independently confirmed, is that there is always a danger of analytical overlay. That is, in other words, misinterpretation of what is seen. And not only that, not every remote viewer uh, hits what they're looking for every time anyway. Uh, there are cases where they just don't see it right. There are cases where mistakes have been made. I've, I've chatted with many remote viewers about this, and none of them are right every time. Uh, yes, there are protocols in place, but that doesn't mean that, uh, you know, you're going to hit a home run every single time you try. So there's something genuine about remote viewing, and that, that something is incredibly important and fascinating to me because it shows that the nature of our reality that we find ourselves in is much richer 
uh, much more fascinating than than this fascinating world already is. Uh, I also feel that it's valid to consider remote viewed information as a real hypothesis in terms of understanding this ET reality. My only uh, where I would the point where I would put on the brakes is in stating, at least for myself, that this is definitively the case. Um, I'm fine with people at least tentatively putting out a qualified statement that, yes, some remote view data points to this direction. But uh, to me, that's still... I have a hard time seeing myself leaving the full extent of my historical training, which still takes me back to uh, documents and statements that I can confirm and corroborate multiple times. So that's where I would stand on remote viewing. Great. Now, let me, we, we, we have uh, uh, just about um, five, five minutes or so left in the, left in the segment. And I, interesting, huh? I, I wanted to, to, uh, to, to read to you a brief uh, excerpt, j just a short pa paragraph from a book that talks about what the reaction will be to disclosure by the extraterrestrials themselves. That, that okay. is, assuming that there is a kind of Independence Day, I, I don't know, uh, event. Okay? And just get mm -hmm. your kind of reaction to it. It says, okay. life as it was before that moment, the, the moment being the, the, the disclosure moment, life as you are living it right now will never be the same again. At that point in your passing, whereby the entire world population is irrefutably confronted with aliens amongst you, the wars for territory, religion, and race that now define your crises will end abruptly. They will simply pale before the spectacle of life from beyond. The loveless eyes of hatred that peer from behind your current fences will all be lifted upward to gaze upon the boundless fields of the cosmos. The powers that be will have no control over you from that moment on, and this they know all too well. What's your reaction to that kind of vision? A little mixed. Um, I think that there's there's some real truth to that. Uh, certainly, I I see that the the shock of our learning of another civilization, another intelligence that operates on a very different level ordinarily than what we seem to operate on. At least, if you look at our uh, TV culture, our political culture, our educational culture, it all operates on a fairly kind of low level of consciousness, in my own opinion. So what will happen is that billions of people suddenly are going to look at that and they're going to think about their lives and they're going to think, I've, I've just been wasting my whole life. <laughs> and it'll be a moment in which many people reconfigure their lives, they reconceptualize their lives, um, and they're going to question uh, a lot and they're going to question the political system that has lied to them for a lifetime or more. Okay. Um, the question that I have with that is whether or not a disclosure or a revelation of this type will change us to the extent that we cease being aggressive with each other, uh, whether it will change us so that we cease having uh, corporations here on planet Earth. There's a question. You know, in terms of basic human organization, corporations are so fundamental to our world today. Will disclosure change that? Will disclosure cause us to uh, go about our business in a, in a way that doesn't require corporations to organize a large project, for example? I, I don't know. It's not clear to me that corporations are just going to melt away, at least not in the first 10, 20 years after this. So I think the, the thing that I would leave this interview with would be that there'll be an immediate repercussion of disclosure and a long-term repercussion of disclosure. And I'm not sure that I can predict the long-term repercussion of disclosure, uh, but I think the immediate, by which I mean the first 20 years, 
um, I don't see us headed toward any kind of utopia right off the bat. I think that we're going to have a great deal of struggle ahead, uh, a lot of a lot of panic to a certain extent, temporary panic, uh, a lot of suspicion, rumor. Uh, I have a feeling it could be a very unpleasant experience. Uh, and you might ask, well, why do I promote it? Because I do. And here's why. The analogy that I would give you is that of a dream. Let's say you're having a dream, and it's a wonderful dream. You're on the beach, the sun is shining, the waves are coming up to your feet, and it's awesome. Except that in real life, your house is on fire. So what do we prefer, the dream or the reality, to wake up and to deal with that fire? Well, I think ultimately we have to wake up. Another analogy would simply be that of growing up and out of adolescence. Perhaps our society is in a kind of adolescence right now. And there's a certain charm to that. I remember being a teenager, having uh, had some angst, but I also had some freedom that I didn't have when I became an adult. Uh, we have responsibilities that we have as we get older. Well, that's just how it is. And I, I would suspect that we as a society have got to go through this period of growth. We can't stay as children forever. And I think that the process of disclosure will be difficult and it will be unpleasant for many of us. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't go through it. That doesn't mean we can't uh, surmount it and become even better ultimately than what we are currently. So I do hold out hope. I do have an optimism in the human spirit and the human species that we can deal with this challenge and we can do it uh, in a way that I think... Um, will do us proud in future generations. That's what I believe. Well, you know, I, I, I'd almost like to, to bring our, our, our interview to a close on, on that note because it's sort of your, your, your highest vision for, for this future. Are there any other words you'd like to leave us with? Or? Well, the last thing that I would just leave anyone listening to this is uh, consider banishing, to the greatest extent possible, banishing fear from the future. It's very easy to be afraid of uncertainty, um, but I, I would suggest that in our history, um, our species, our civilizations that we've had have dealt with one crisis after another. We're not unique in that regard. All right, people of the past have handled sometimes better, sometimes worse, but I've dealt with just a long period of difficulty, challenges. Uh, we've got ours now. And, you know, we're up to it. We can, we can deal with it. And I also say, let's not let ourselves be afraid of these other beings, even if some of them may not have our best interests at heart, which I think is probably the case. I think that there's a mixed bag out there, but people could allow themselves to be afraid if they really decided to go that route. And I think it's just not productive. It's not helpful. And it's also just not necessary. I think we're up to the job of dealing with these challenges. We just have to um, get our A game on, stay calm, stay focused, and believe in ourselves. And I think we can, we can achieve greatness in the next century. Well, thank you, and and I and I hope, Richard, that that you'll come and join us again from time to time as as we move through this, especially after disclosure occurs. <laughs> we will have. That's right. We'll have a uh, we'll have a nice, long, happy, but in, engaged conversation because we'll have new trials and new difficulties that we'll be needing to deal with at that time. But we'll do it. Exactly. We'll still both be here. Mm -hmm. Good. Good enough. Well, thank you. Been a pleasure. Thanks.